still waking up. That's the entrance. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm gonna stop at some places and talk about the ecology and history of where we are. Uh, when I do that, especially at this first stop, since we're kind of a bigger group, it's really important that we get super close into each other. Another thing too, it's kind of important since we're a bigger group, uh, if you guys would try to stay within 100 yards of me or like within eyesight you know which everyone's kind of like shorter um i was telling the people in the van uh, a couple of months ago i was out here with a woman who i uh, was lagging way far behind and taking photos and i had to remind her twice to try to keep up and i eventually lost her um i found her it wasn't that difficult she wasn't that lost at all you can't really get that lost out there um but i'd rather not have to go through those hard palpitations if i don't have to um let's see what else uh, the odds of us seeing alligators today it's a little tricky. It's, it's kind of been getting cooler lately, so they don't come out as often. Um, since it's warmer right now, though, the odds are probably close to 100% that we're going to see alligators today. Uh, no. No, you cannot throw me in. <laughs> what? <laughs> what I will say about that, the American alligator is the most docile of all large crocodilians in the world. Um, before Hurricane Ida, there had never been a recorded fatality from an alligator attack in the history of the state of Louisiana. A Hurricane Ida did change that, though. Um, that being said, though, they are wild animals. You never know what they're going to do. They can be deadly. Uh, I usually ask folks to give them at least 20 feet worth of space, and that's not because I think they're going to do anything, that's really more just because if you get right on top of them, they'll feel molested, they're probably not going to be here next time for the next tours. Uh, one more thing I always add also is people that are from Louisiana on these tours are usually a lot more cautious around the alligators than folks that aren't from Louisiana, so you guys can interpret that as you will as well. Um, my name's Evan, I always forget to say that. Uh, I'm from Louisiana, born and raised, I'm actually Cajun, don't have any accident on what happened to it. Um, that's pretty much it. When you guys get in the boats, if you would, uh, kind of hang out in this area right here until I get launched and situated. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Which way? <laughs> Ooh. Way better than my yard. I know, this feels so much easier. What is going on? <laughs> what? It's like we don't even need to put in much effort. What? Hey, why are you moving? Why are you moving? Why are you moving? Your bird. Are you okay now? Uh -huh. The water is actually clean, it's not like gooey with moss. Don't stop shaking! <laughs> stuff at night? I'm a werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> I like being out at night. I thought that was going to be us. Who? All the way in the back, spinning in circles. <laughs> oh, they're getting tied to his kayak? I, I think so. I, really? Is that what he said? Hey, I want to be tied up too. Maybe we should pretend that we can't do it either. No, <laughs> obviously can't. Right, one's pointy and one's yeah. squared. Yeah. Oh. And they're smaller. Yeah. They're smaller. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything yet? 
Here, no. I've never seen alligator in my life. But Me I've too. seen crocodiles and I've touched them. You've touched them Which too? Which was very a bad decision, I guess. But was it a wild one or was it like... Only one. A wild oh, one? Man, you're brave, brave. A Nile alligator in Africa. Ooh. Yeah. Let's not get over there. Where? See that black line over there just floating in the water? It's like the only black thing in that shimmer of light. <gasps> there? Yeah. That's an alligator. Oh my god. We'll almost certainly see more alligators. Uh, if we've already spotted one, like already, um, it's a good sign. The water's kind of low and it's warm as it is, especially if the sun starts coming out, we'll see a bunch of alligators. All right. So the area we're in today is called Manchac Swamp. Uh, Manchac is a Native American term that means back door. So back in the 1700s, Iberville and Bienville were looking for a way to get into the Mississippi River without having to find the mouth of the river. Uh, back then, finding the mouth of the river was actually kind of difficult to do. Uh, and once you did, you had to go 100 miles worth of river travel to get to New Orleans, and then 100 more miles worth of river travel to get to uh, Baton Rouge. So this back door, uh, this series of interconnected waterways, allowed them to get pretty much directly from Lake Pontchartrain into the Mississippi River around the Baton Rouge area. So they saved 200 miles worth of river travel and all the taxes and hassles and fees of uh, bringing your stuff through a major port city. Uh, this particular part of Banchak Swamp is called Shell Bank Bayou. Uh, the reason they call it that is because those same Native Americans used these small white ranchia clams. Uh, they would throw the shells out into these piles, and over time the piles grew tall enough they could build their homes on top of them and escape the floodwaters. Um, so they actually lived, uh, uh, originally lived north of Lake Pontchartrain and would just come down here to fish and hunt. Uh, but once they were able to build their homes here, they moved in full time. Uh, also, this tree behind me is called a bald cypress tree. Uh, this is the state tree of Louisiana. These trees can actually grow 160 feet tall, uh, they can live 2200 years, and uh, they can be 80 feet around the tops, around the branches. Uh, back in the day when folks first came here to settle, these were actually the tallest forests in the entire country, second only to the redwoods. Uh, and unfortunately, between the 1700s and the 1950s, they clear-cut all of it. Uh, the only old-growth trees that remain out here um, have growth defects so they would never get big, uh, or they were too crooked to make good for it. Uh, the reason they like making lumber out of these trees is because they have a natural oil in them that makes them very resistant to water and insects. Uh, so what they would do is take a uh, tall tree like this and run a cable from the tree into the wooded area. Uh, they would go back into there with uh, smaller boats, and they would find the trees they wanted to cut down. They would cut a big slice in the bottom of the tree and let all the sap drain out. And with the sap drained out like that, uh, they would drag the tree out here to the bayou and they would float. Um, not all of them did float out of it, some of them sank. Uh, and so people will still come out here today in these small uh, specialized boats with like cranes and winches on them and haul out these sunken trees. Uh, and I've heard, I've never actually witnessed this with my own eyes, but I hear that oil makes them so resistant to water that even if the tree has been on the bottom for a hundred years or more, when they haul them out, sometimes they're still dry on the inside. So cool stuff. Uh, another thing I'll talk about before we move on are these uh, root structures. These are called cypress knees. Uh, nobody really knows what their purpose actually is. Uh, some folks think it might just be a more elaborate root structure to help anchor these trees to the soft earth. Uh, some folks think it might be actually like a way for the tree to get a little extra oxygen. Uh, what I will say though is when it floods, they typically catch a lot of storm debris, which in turn catches like a lot of mud and sand and silt and stuff like that, and builds up all this land. So uh, all of this is like river mud held in place over millions of years by the roots of these trees. Uh, but anyway, we'll keep heading down this way. Uh, we're going to turn left in this narrow body of water. Um, I usually say this where we first start seeing alligators, but we did just spot that guy. Uh, we'll certainly see some a lot closer than him though. Um, hopefully as warm as it is out today, we might even see some out of the water sunning. So we'll go back that way and see what we can find. <laughs> Let's go look for the alligator. You see it? Yeah, let's let's go a little bit. Where? 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 Okay, he's there, he's there. Do you see it? Yeah, there's two of them. <gasps> okay, okay, we're going to crash. Do the uh, do the alligators eat the turtles? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, they eat pretty much anything. Uh, they're really optimistic. They like uh, stuff that's already dead too. Mm. But they'll eat uh, they'll eat fish, they eat turtles, birds, other alligators, uh, a lot of mammals out here. Uh, we've got an invasive uh, like species of rodent called Nutria, and uh, they love going to town on the Nutria. <laughs> uh, Spanish moss, actually kind of funny named. It's not Spanish, and it's also not a moss. Uh, it's a bromeliad, which means it's uh, interestingly enough related to orchids and also pineapples. 
Hmm. Um, it's an epiphyte, which means it grows in this tree, but it takes nothing from it. Uh, it's not a parasite. Uh, the only bad thing Spanish moss can really do to a tree is cover up the leaves and stun its growth. And also trees that typically have more Spanish moss uh, usually blow over a little bit sooner in like windstorms, stuff like that. Uh, the reason they call it Spanish moss is because way back in the day when the French first got here, they called it Spanish beard. Um, and of course, European rivalries being what they are, uh, when the Spanish got here, they started calling it French hair. Uh, the Native American term for it, though, is panchatula, which means blowing hair. Uh, if you've ever heard the term, don't let the bed bugs bite, that actually doesn't refer to bed bugs as a species of insect. Uh, it refers to Spanish moss. So uh, way back in the day, folks would come here uh, and like gather a bunch of Spanish moss to stuff their pillows and mattresses and stuff like that. Uh, and you can imagine the amount of Spanish moss it takes to stuff a whole mattress. Uh, you would bring other things in from the swamp, too, and so people would wake up with like bug bites and rash and stuff like that. You see how moving? No. Oh, yeah. Oh. You see how? about those alligators. Um, sometimes when they go under, they'll release bubbles, so you can kind of follow the trail and see where they're headed. They uh, usually don't stay under for too, too long. Uh, they can't hold their breath for up to an hour, but they usually only do that when they're drowning prey. So. But anyway, how many of y'all believe in ghosts? Yeah? Well, this swamp is allegedly haunted. So uh, back in 1915, there was a woman named Julia Brown who uh, lived in New Orleans, and legend has it she was a uh, voodoo priestess. Uh, but in my own independent research, it kind of seems like she was more like an earth-based kind of spiritual healer kind of thing. Um, she had a husband who died and left her 40 acres worth of swamp land out here. So uh, she moved out here to kind of sort of doing her own thing. Um, if you know what you're doing out in the swamp, you can live pretty much indefinitely off of the food that's available out here. So she was kind of doing that. Uh, but because it was 1950, they were still logging out here. So you can imagine when you clear cut all the trees out of here, uh, the ecosystem kind of collapses. You're not really able to support yourself the same way that you would before. Uh, so she had to see what they were doing, um, you know, to her... her food sources, I guess, uh, and also just kind of hate to see that they were messing up her beautiful swamp. And so she decided one day she was going to do something about it. She started putting curses on all the loggers and the equipment and the buildings and the, everything she could think of. Uh, she sat on her front porch and sang to herself all day long, when I die, I'm going to take this whole town with me. And so it got to the point where uh, loggers would go out for a day's worth of work and not all of them would come back at the end of the day. And so the logging companies decided whether they believed in voodoo or thought Julia Brown was behind any of this or all that stuff, uh, they were going to do something of themselves uh, just to improve morale. So they went out there and found her singing on her front porch one day and hauled her into town and hung her in the town square. And three or four hours after that, this massive hurricane blew in, the hurricane of 1915. Uh, that was actually the last major storm to pass like directly through this part of like this specific area of Louisiana. Uh, so everybody uh, took refuge in this railroad depot where they stored wood waiting to be processed. Um, and the winds picked up so violently that the building collapsed and killed 95% of the town. Jeez. So the day she died, her prophecy came true. People say so to this day, if you come out here at night, you can hear her singing still. Uh, and they also say every once in a while, groups will come out in the swamp and not everybody comes back. <laughs> you guys don't have to worry about that. I haven't lost a tourist since that lady a couple of months ago. <laughs> uh, but anyway, like I said, if you know what you're looking for out here, you can pretty much live indefinitely. Uh, there's a lot of food sources out here. Um, people did actually, during the Great Depression, come out here just to live, because you could for free. Um, it's kind of difficult to see right now. I always stop at a spot that's not good for spotting them. Uh, but there is, there's some back there, actually. There's these uh, elephant ear looking plants. Uh, instead of being big, broad leaves like elephant ears are, they're kind of like pointed, like an arrow. They kind of look like an arrow head. Uh, they're actually called arrow arum. Uh, at the base of the clusters of those stalks is a tuber. Uh, and if you dug that tuber up uh, and you boiled it, and, and I think I read online the Native Americans had to boil it for like nine hours straight. Uh, it's kind of like a potato, uh, so you could eat that. Uh, there's also oyster mushrooms. There's wild brown rice that grows out here. Uh, there's uh, palm plants that you can hang in the middle of. You can get the part the palm out of there. Uh, the natives would also use those to thatch their homes. Uh, so between that and the fish and the reptiles and the mammals and the birds, uh, you can pretty much live out here indefinitely. And like I said, people did during the Great Depression. Ooh, are we going to get poop on? That's a lot. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm having 
here, the truck and the motorcycle. To do what? Anything. Yeah. You can like go to National Park. And yeah. Pick up truck, I could just like park it up here and then just come at night time. Just... Night time again. <laughs> uh -huh. Always at night, huh? You know what, bring your tent? Yeah. The sleeping bag? Mm, no. Oh. I, mean, I don't think you need it. What? Where are you going to sleep? I have a little blanket. Pretty gross. <laughs> hmm? It's very gross. <laughs> gross? Mm -hmm. That's how we used to live when we were cavemen. When you were what? When we were cavemen. Mm. When we lived in the wild. Were you born then? Mm -hmm. If I born then? <laughs> Maybe. We're going through lots of stumps. We just have to push ourselves away from it. If we get stuck. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, when the car soon. <laughs> this part is fun. Uh, kayak jam. <laughs> yeah. Very gentle. Ooh. I'm anchoring the boat now. <laughs> we don't float away anywhere. Another fish. You know, usually I say, I like this part of the swamp because usually at this point you can't hear the interstate anymore. Um, but unfortunately after the hurricane, because these trees just got so defoliated from the wind and uh, so many trees got pushed over, you can both see and hear a lot deeper into the swamp than you normally can. Um, but because we're, you know, out here and kind of at a stopping point, usually at this place I'll, uh, I'll just kind of tell you guys all the alligator facts that I know. Um, so alligators do this thing when it gets cold outside uh, called brumation, which is like hibernation, but they don't actually lose consciousness. Uh, they slow their metabolism down, um, like enough that they only have to like breathe once every 24 hours. Uh, they'll dig like a little mud den on the bottom of the water, uh, or sometimes even like a tunnel into the side of the bank, and they just kind of chill in there. Um, and like I said, they don't actually lose consciousness, so if the water gets like above a certain temperature, if like there's a nice sunny day or something like that, uh, they will come back out and hunt. Um, alligators though can't chew their food, they pretty much just swallow everything whole. Uh, they can like tear things off, you know, into smaller bits. Uh, but because they don't chew, uh, it takes them a long time to digest their food. And so they don't actually need to hunt very often. Um, so they can pretty much just, you know, stay down there as you know, long as they need to. Uh, but anyway, once the temperature of the water gets above like 60, 65 degrees or so, they'll come out and start looking for food. Um, and then like early spring, I guess around like April or so, uh, they'll start like, you know, mating. Um, so the way they initiate that is they'll do this thing called bellowing. Uh, they make this like deep guttural roar and all the water around them shakes. Um, it's actually a, like a super low frequency and they can hear it for like a mile and a half away. Uh, that's how they like stake their territory and find a mate. Uh, and so I guess around May or so they'll actually do their mating and start making nests. Um, they make their nests out of mud and vegetation. And the action of the vegetation rotting is what keeps the nest warm. Uh, and so actually the temperature of the nest is also what determines the gender of the, uh, of the eggs. So if the, uh, the nest is above like 87, 88 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, they'll all be male. And if it's below like 83 or 84 degrees Fahrenheit, they'll all be female. And if it's right in the middle, the top of the nest will be male and the bottom will be female. Uh, where they lay those uh, eggs also can kind of like, you know, determine the gender. Um, if you can imagine like, you know, out here in the swamps where there's a lot of trees and a lot of shade, it's going to be a little bit cooler. Uh, out in the marshes, it's mostly tall grasses. Uh, and so out there, it's going to be a lot warmer. Um, and so here, you know, it's more likely to be female out in the marshes, a little bit more likely to be male. Um, when alligators are hatched, they're about six to eight inches long. Uh, they eat like small little fish, frogs, insects, uh, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, everything out here eats them though. Uh, frogs, turtles, uh, birds, other alligators, fish, everything eats them. Uh, so much so that actually uh, baby alligators only have a 1 in 100 chance of growing to be an adult. Uh, and by adult, I mean like 5 or 6 feet. Um, as long as they have all the food they need, they can grow about a foot a year. Uh, and so they will grow about a foot a year until they get to about 12 feet. Um, and they'll still grow beyond that. Uh, the largest alligator ever caught in uh, the history of Louisiana was uh, 19 feet 4 inches and 2,200 pounds. 
so they can get pretty big. Um, but you're probably not going to find any that size out here these days, and if you did, you'd have to really know what you were doing, go way deep into the swamp um, where there's no people and no other alligators, that sort of thing. Uh, typically, on average, uh, males grow between 12 and 14, and uh, females grow between 10 and 12. Um, they can grow as, like, as old as like 60, 70 years. Uh, I've heard that in captivity, the oldest one uh, lived to be over 90, and actually just recently died not long ago. Uh, let's see what else. Um, okay, so I said they can grow about a foot a year as long as they have all the food they need. Uh, once they get around five or six feet, they probably have gone like a dry spell you know, for a while where they haven't been able to find food. Uh, they can go a full year without eating uh, once they get like you know to adult size. Um, and so if they have had to go like a long time without eating, uh, they've probably slowed down. And so once you get to around five or six feet, it's difficult to really estimate their age just by purely judging by uh, their length. Um, one of the things that they do love to eat out here though are uh, this like large invasive rodent species called nutria. Uh, nutria are from South America. Uh, down there, their native term or native word is uh, koipu. Um, they are either the second or third largest rodent in the world, depending on who you ask. Uh, they're kind of tied with beavers. Uh, and in fact, they actually kind of look like a beaver, but instead of having like, a big like flappy paddle tail, they've got like a rat tail. Uh, they also have like bright orange, like beaver looking teeth. Um, so like I said, they came from South America. Um, back in the 1800s, like the late 1800s, the early 1900s, uh, one of the South American countries down there had like a fad where everybody was eating uh, nutria meat and uh, like wearing the fur. And so it was actually lucrative enough that people could farm nutria up here and then ship the meat and the fur back down there to that country. So they were doing that uh, until about the 30s or 40s uh, when the industry for that kind of dried up. So a lot of the farmers that were around here actually ended up releasing all their stock into the wild. Uh, under perfect conditions, nutria can breed three times a year. And so the population just exploded. Like they love this habitat. Um, they burrow into, well, okay, getting ahead of myself here a little bit. Nutria are probably the worst invasive species, plant or animal in the entire state of Louisiana. Uh, what makes them so bad is they'll burrow into levees and just like weaken the levees with the tunnels. Uh, they also eat a lot of vegetation, which increases erosion. We've got a serious coastal erosion problem in Louisiana. I forget the actual figures, but it's something like a football field worth of land lost every 30 minutes. Uh, Hurricane Ida actually uh, destroyed 160 square miles of land. And that land, unless we figure out some way to divert the sediment from the rivers, um, just will not come back. It's, it disappears forever. So uh, the, the, the erosion that caused, you know, caused by them eating all the vegetation is a serious problem. Uh, they'll also like, steal bait out of traps and destroy farm equipment, that sort of thing. Uh, there's such an awful nuisance down here that um, there's actually a bounty on them. So if you kill a nutria and bring the tail in, the game warden will give you six dollars. Uh, and I, I mean, I heard some guy last year made like sixty-five thousand dollars doing nothing but hunting nutria. So there's a lot of them out here. Um, I don't typically see very many out here in these tours, though, and I don't know exactly why that is. Uh, the only thing I can think of, my theory, is that we're kind of on like a thin strip of land between two lakes, and I think because it's kind of a thin strip of land, it kind of affects a lot of the, the wildlife out here. Uh, for instance, the alligators that we see out here typically are a lot smaller than I see in other places in Louisiana. Um, but yeah, uh, one more thing I'll add too. I, I mentioned the, uh, the largest alligator, the 19 foot 4 inch alligator. Uh, that was caught by uh, the McElhenneys, who are the guys who started Tabasco. Uh, and that's also who is credited with um, releasing the largest amount of nutria out there back in the 30s and 40s. So that's another fun little tidbit. Uh, but like I said, we're pretty much as far into the swamp as we're going to go. Uh, usually at this point, I tell folks we can kind of like enjoy not paddling for a little bit, just kind of sit here, sip some water, eat a snack. Um, you can take some photos if you want. And after uh, you know a few minutes of that, we'll mosey back to the launch. I want to get there right on time. So, yeah. He has some sandwiches here. I do have chicken bacon ranch. Okay, he's going to say, roll, roll your boat right now. Go. I saw the first. Quick, go. The first line. Go. Roll, roll, roll your boat. Gently down the river. <laughs> the swamp. Uh-huh, and? <laughs> and there's two crocodiles over here. No. One to the left and one to the right. Why? Uh -oh. oh, he's hungry. Oh, it's true. Oh, my God. They're like, yeah. oh, wow. Fun? Oh yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> I mean, God, redo it without the F word. <laughs> I mean, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 
there. I saw some alligators. Yeah, I saw some alligators. What else? I saw some alligators. Ah, uh, some turtles. Turtles. Too. Yeah, baby turtles, big turtles. Lots of birds. And I learned a fun fact. What? That alligators eat alligators. Uh, it's like cannabis. Yeah, but eat human meat. Would I? <laughs> I, was... I? I guess. I guess if I was like. Uh, Hear that? Stranded. You gotta be stranded careful. Somewhere. Never get stranded with him. Uh -huh. mm -hmm.